Okay, so we're just past two o'clock, so I think we'll just get started. Um, I think we've still got some people joining, but um, just um, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Diabetes Data Science Catalyst webinar, the showcase webinar. I'm Sarah Lessels. I'm a research project manager at the Data Science Centre, working with Kesha Ian Pearson, the Associate Director for the Diabetes Data Science Catalyst. And before we start today, I just need to say that today's webinar will be recorded and captions are enabled. So I'll just run through the agenda for the webinar this afternoon. First of all, we have Professor Pearson, who will give an overview of the aims and plans for the Catalyst. Ewan is also joined by Senior Health Data Scientist John Nolan, who will talk to us about the data resources and access for diabetes research. We're then going to hear from Dr. Cameron Rosaya, epidemiologist and statistician from the Diabetes Research Centre at the University of Leicester. Cameron will discuss he and his team's experiences of working within the CVD COVID UK COVID impact infrastructure on their projects working about the, on the influence of multimorbidity. I will then provide some information about our upcoming funding call. Um, we'll then have some time at the end for a discussion, so please post all of your questions in the Q&A and we will do our best to answer all of the questions posted. However, if we don't have time to answer the questions, we will be contactable at the end of the event to follow up on any queries. So without any further ado, I will pass on to you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, so I'm going to talk to you for the next 25 minutes or so around the data science catalyst. Um, so what is the diabetes data science catalyst? So some of you may have heard of it, I suspect um, many of you haven't yet, and this is partly why we're having the showcase to try and get everyone on, on, on board and, and realize what we're up to. Um, so the catalyst was formed as a partnership. So it is a partnership between Diamonds UK, BHF and HDR UK. Um, and was funded um, for three years from May, last year um, and that's when I took up this role as the lead for the catalyst and associate director of the of the data science center um, and basically the vision is that we will try and um, improve access to and increase use of diabetes data um, in in the in the health data data science and AI space so yeah as I say we launched last May we had a little bit of coverage um, in relation to that, um, mostly in Scotland uh, rather than anywhere else. So what are our goals? Um, so what we want to do in the Catalyst um, really falls into these five areas, um, which firstly is around providing guidance. So in partly what we're doing with this showcase, but what we want to do is make the diabetes community aware of all of the different diabetes data resources that are available out there. Um, and by doing that, um, and by other approaches, we hope to increase the use of diabetes data. We want to encourage um, people working together and agreeing um, what would be sort of standard computable phenotypes, so defining, for example, and agreeing the code for type of diabetes, type 1, type 2, or complications of diabetes. Um, and John will talk to you more about um, how we will essentially have all of these phenotypes in notebooks available for people to use. We want to go beyond data and think about the cohorts that are available um, within the UK. There's a huge number of diabetes cohorts um, which have served their purpose to some extent in terms of doing the work that they were set up to do, but where we can really enhance them by linking to national data. And finally, there's um, our plan is to, to initiate a, um, some driver projects. And you'll have seen that there's a call for funding um, and that pertains to these driver projects amongst others within the BHF Data Science Centre. So diabetes specific projects that will hopefully um, do exactly what we want to do, increase the use of diabetes data and get people working together. And of course, it's key that we do all of this in the context of what is um, right and useful and of interest to people living with diabetes. So we have a strong element of involving and engaging people living with diabetes. So 
what most of this talk is is going to be about is is the the concepts here of sort of improving awareness of data um, and with a view to increasing the use of diabetes data so how are we providing guidance to researchers well we will have um, a website um, that we, we have already gathered lots of data together that we will make available not yet um, available um, and that website will include key facts around data and we want really to include as much detail as possible and for some of the data sets we have access to will include links to dashboards where you can actually explore some of the data coverage and we'll hear more about that from John um, and importantly we want a place where you can just learn more about what is that data and how do you apply for it so if you are a researcher or anyone from industry or anyone interested in knowing what's out there you know wh where do you come to and this is what we hope to be covering in in, in our website and i'm just going to talk through essentially what i've learned in the last um, nine months around the data availability and there's there's a huge potential and lots of you on the call will probably know about lots of this data already but i'm sort of assuming that some of you have come to this call with with limited knowledge around what what data is and i think the most exciting potential is around what we now have in terms of complete population-wide coverage so england wales scotland um, and in brackets northern ireland which we hope is is coming or large-scale data and I'm, so i'm going to walk through what population-wide and large-scale data sets are available some of the work that's been done in this data um, and how you might access it before coming on to some of the more regional or bespoke data sets that, that, that people have. So the, the first data set it's important to, to flag is of course the National Diabetes Audit. Um, and this data is available for uh, urgent policy related questions. I'll come back to that. But the NDA um, essentially includes what's called the core audit, which is primary care data, particular fields that have been specified as being necessary for diabetes audit, and then a variety of diabetes specific audit data sets, so pregnancy data, foot care data, inpatient data, and recently retinal screening data that's just come on board. Um, if you use the QR code there, that would take you to Naomi Holman's diabetic medicine paper. Um, which is a really nice cohort description paper um, of exactly what is in the NDA um, and how to use it. Um, so there's there's been lots of papers published by the NDA and um, I can't obviously do them all justice. I just pulled out a couple recent ones. So this is one from Naomi and Naveed just out in diabetes care that shows that there isn't an increased risk of diabetes after COVID any more than you'd expect up than was seen after pneumonia. Um, and a, a lovely paper from Shivani Mizra and Jonathan Vilabji and others around DKA rates during COVID and the fact that they were particularly high in people with type 2 diabetes and um, particularly type 2 diabetes in the non-white population. So some really lovely data that's uh, results that have emerged from this analysis. So the NDA is a data set that you can apply to um, and the usual route of application um, is via the DARS process where you can apply for a DARS extract. There is an alternative route, um, which is um, where you apply and the NDA Research Advisory Group would review um, an application. Um, and that specifically has to be something that would, where the, the, the question is a, uh, has a clinical need that can only be delivered, that needs to be delivered in a short time frame and precludes going through the DARS process. That's the key thing. Uh, has to have interest from and, and engagement from services and commissioners. The issues have to be important and need to be addressed quickly, as I've just said. Um, so so that's, that is available as a process, um, but it has to meet those criteria and be reviewed and approved by the research advisory group. So next data set, and the one that we're going to be focusing on today, actually, is the, the data that's available within the the national trusted research environments. So whenever we talk about TREs, that's what we mean, trusted research environments. Um, and these are um, available in England, Wales, and Scotland. So we can and are analyzing data across these three data sets um, with the current 
Um, you can apply individually to each of these and via the DARS or via a PBMPP application um, for any particular research that you're interested in, but specifically uh, we have approvals for COVID related research in this space. So what do we have in the TREs? So we essentially have the complete population capture for England, uh, Scotland, Wales, and as I say, Northern Ireland, asterisk pending. Um, so, um, and we have approvals, which I'll outline, um, for COVID related research under these, this umbrella project, which a bit of a tongue twister, which is CVD COVID UK stroke COVID impact. Um, so COVID related research in this data. So what is really nice about this is that there is the, the governance is in place for this already. So there is program level approval and regulatory approval um, that is coordinated by the BHF Data Science Center. So that applications all happen. We have the approvals to access that data in England, Scotland and Wales um, for COVID related research. So there's no need for you as an individual, if you want to apply to analyze this data to apply separately and go through the headache of, of, of all of those applications that's been done. What you have to do if you're interested in analyzing this data is submit a proposal um, as part of the consortium, the CBD COVID UK COVID impact consortium um, to, to um, with a project um, for approval. Now that will go to um, a lay panel and then an oversight board um, for review. Um, and um, so it's relatively light touch um, but obviously that whole process is to ensure that all of the approvals that have been, um, uh, all the restrictions are, are met in, in terms of who, what you can apply to do. But that is a, a streamlined quick process that takes a few weeks. So within a few weeks um, of submission, you should know whether or not you have approval to access the data and you can start to then um, contract with NHS Digital to get into the data if your institution is not already one of the institutions involved. So this um, slide, which certainly on my screen looks like it's gone slightly um, screwy, um, uh, basically just shows the, the data that's available. And John's going to go back over this um, in more detail. But I've just put this up to show you the, the depth of data that is available in this data set um, or in these three data sets. So you can see um, data on the, the entire populations, primary care data, secondary care data, COVID data, ITU data. I mean, I, I, hopefully you can see um, the level of data that we have. So it is really quite impressive what can be done. So again, QR code there will take you to the list of the approved projects that fall under the CBD COVID UK COVID impact um, studies. Um, and these are the ones I pulled out as having a diabetes element. Um, there may be other projects in there that do have some diabetes in that weren't obvious just from, from the headings, but these are, these are the ones. So there's a project from Naveed looking at risk factors, the cardiovascular risk factors, including HbA1c, um, a paper that I will outline in a second, looking at medicines and looking particularly at diabetes medicines and cardiovascular medicines over COVID. Um, looking at uh, why people with diabetes have a greater risk of becoming unwell, um, led by Adrian Heald. Um, new onset diabetes following COVID, which is Kamrish Kunti and Cameron Razi. Um, Cameron speaking to us um, in a bit about his work, although mostly on a different project to do with multimorbidity. And a project that I've just put in and got approved, and I can vouch for the, the process as being fairly streamlined, uh, looking at SGLT2 inhibitors. COVID-19 and DKA. So that's the, the, the ongoing projects. I thought it would be useful just to put a little bit of, of science into the talk. Um, and you may have heard this work being discussed um, just a few weeks ago. And this was Richard Sofat um, and colleagues work looking at medicines um, in cashment data um, from across the three nations, England, Scotland and Wales. So just saying that I think is amazing that this is a study that's done across England, Scotland and Wales, 1.32 billion records of community dispensed medications. Um, and what the plot on the right shows is the red line is antihypertensives, the blue line is lipid lowering drugs, purple is 
um, type 2 diabetes drugs and green is insulin. So, and then the, the, the dash line here is the first wave, um, second wave, third wave, but, and this is incident prescribing and not prevalent prescribing. So new users of antihypertensives um, and lipid lowering and oral hyperglycemic drugs dramatically fell at the, uh, at the uh, first wave of COVID. Interestingly, and I'm sure there's lots that we can think about this, the, the insulin, new insulin prescribing didn't drop. Um, but you can extrapolate, you can see the number of people that should have started who didn't, and therefore extrapolate that in terms of the predicted risk in terms of number of, of additional events. So I think a, a beautiful paper, a lovely example of what we can do using three nation complete population data. And that got a lot of coverage. This is Reacher on BBC News um, and got uh, yeah, some really good coverage. And it's really um, excitedly be picked up by Tesco who, who have cited this work as the evidence for their rollout of free blood pressure measurements that they're now doing um, across the, the, the stores. So that was an example of, of the TRE, um, NHS, Digital, Wales and Scotland data and CBD COVID UK, and you'll hear more about that from John. So other big data sets out there are open safely. Um, so again, this requires a COVID related question at the moment. Um, it largely focuses on, on a primary care provider TPP, although it is possible to analyze EMIS data as well. Um, I had a look at their projects and there are five diabetes related projects in there. What's interesting is you can see some overlap between the works ongoing in the, uh, the CBD COVID UK work versus the work that's going on in Open Safely, which of course is fine. You could easily argue that duplication is a good thing, but it would maybe be good to coordinate and, and, and think about how we can better work together across these different um, potential um, analyses. Again, the QR code there will take you to the approved projects and also will get, take you to a, the process where you need to apply um, if you want to access this data. There's another data set that um, some of you may be aware of, I certainly wasn't, um, which is the ONS, the Office for National Statistics. So, so this has the same primary care data as is available within um, the, the English TRE. Um, again, you can apply to work on their safe, their, their safe haven, their TRE to use this. And the big advantage there is it gives you access to the census data, which I believe is the only place that you can access that. Um, so if you have a particular interest where, where the census data would be relevant, then you'd need to go to ONS. And um, not population wide, but I thought it's, we can't talk about data without talking about CPRD. So this is primary care data. Again, you can apply, not COVID restricted, you can apply um, to this, uh, um, through, through a process to get access to CPRD. Um, and CPRD has um, a fair chunk of the population. So the latest CPRD called CPRD Aurum um, is taken from EMIS Web as, a, as the primary care system. There's 7 million alive and registered people accounting for 13% of the population. Um, a total of 19 million people, if you include people who um, have died or not, um, no longer registered at those practices. Um, and there's the follow-up time. So this data is from John Dennis and colleagues from Exeter. So thanks, John, for this. Um, but what John and key team have done is, is define people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes and look at the, the ever versus alive or actively registered. So there's 636,000 uh, actively registered people, um, type 1 predominantly, of course, versus type 2. And there's their clinical characteristics, duration, HbA1c's. Um, these slides will be available for you to look through. Um, and importantly, CPRD Aurum is one primary care provider. Then CPRD Gold, which is one that's been going for a lot longer, is data from, um, from Vision, a different GP prescriber that has currently 3 million registered um, and alive individuals. So the two of these really make up for quite a nice population. And a, a, a shameless plug for some of the work that I've been involved in, but particularly led by John Dennis and Bev Shields, um, which was taking CPRD, actually CPRD gold, and looking at defining glycemic response to SGLT2 inhibitors versus DPP4 inhibitors and predicting who's going to respond to those. 
um, and that was published in Lancet Digital Health last year. And finally, um, and I, I, apologies, there may well be more population-wide data sets, but, or, but I wanted just to mention the Scottish data. So this is the SDRN data and the Sky Diabetes data. Um, so there are two routes into the, the Scottish data. First, anyone can apply to, Sky, to, to get access to Sky Diabetes data which um, would be made available within the Scottish National Data Safe Haven. Um, it requires an application to the Public Benefit and Privacy Panel um, and, um, it, and, and takes some time. Um, the, the alternative route is that there is, there is a group of Scottish researchers, the STRN Epidemiology Group, of which I'm part, um, who work on Sky Diabetes data and other linked data um, and they have an overarching ethics and PB and PP approval for this. So there's a lovely description paper just published um, from Helen Colquhoun's group. Um, again, if you look, click on the QR code, that will take you there. So that explains everything about the SDRN um, data set. Um, but the key figures here are we have complete coverage essentially of everyone with diabetes in Scotland and about 472,000 uh, people with diabetes in that. Um, and Anna Barnett is the SGRN manager. You can email her if you want more information. So Helen um, and colleagues have published a couple of papers. There's many more SDRN papers from other authors, but I just pulled out these two as being of interest. One is looking at how DKA rates are increasing in Scotland and how the socioeconomic disparities are really driving that increased uh, risk. Um, and a lovely pharmacoepi paper which shows in the real world what uh, the impacts of dapagliflozin are on glycemic control and cardiovascular risk. There's, there's many more that have come out from the SDRN epidemiology group. So that was the population-wide data. There are many other data sets, and I'm only just starting to get a feel for what these are. Um, the, the, there is an increasing um, effort around these regional um, secure data environments, SDEs, um, and other national data sets. So I'm very keen on trying to understand better and pull together people who have access to retinal imaging data. Um, I'm very keen on getting CGM data um, and watching closely around what might be happening with, with the Freestyle Libra data coming into Glasgow. Um, and there are groups who have um, fairly large diabetes inpatient data sets. And then the final area that um, I want to talk about briefly is around cohorts and clinical studies um, data sets. So um, how can we extend the research possibilities of diabetes cohorts? So I'm conscious of time and I won't spend too long on this, but I think I'm sure you're all aware now of the potential benefits of having a cohort linked to national data and UK Biobank, of course, is really the exemplar of how good you can, uh, how good it is to link cohort data, particularly with genomics and other biomarkers to, 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 to national um, available data and primary care data. I just wanted to just in a couple of minutes, just talk through a little bit of work that I've done, which shows that utility. Um, and this was looking at the phenotype of people with type two diabetes and capturing the heterogeneity of this phenotype. So this is work that came out last year. And we've, what we've done is look at 23,000 people in Scotland who were captured at diagnosis of type two diabetes. So we go back through the records and at the point at which they were diagnosed, we pull out their clinical parameters here, which are lipids, blood pressure, um, BMI, um, ALT, et cetera. And then we essentially undertake a dimensionality reduction approach um, to produce this tree. Um, so every dot on the tree here is a person and you overlay the phenotype, you can see that up at the top left, people have really high HDL, they have good HbA1c, at the top right, they've got high blood pressure, and at the bottom, they're really metabolically adverse with high triglycerides and a high BMI. We can show using the linked data in this population that the people at the bottom are at increased risk of progression to insulin, cardiovascular disease and kidney disease, but it's the people with the high blood pressure at the top right that are really at the risk of getting the background retinopathy and, um, and referable retinopathy. We can validate that in UK Biobank. And then we can also take clinical trial data and map it to the tree and show that 
people res respond differently, and this is to do with failure, people respond differently to metformin and sulfonylureas than they do to thiazolidine diones. So if you're down at the bottom left of the tree here, you fail quicker on TZDs than you do, um, uh, the, but if you fail quicker to sulfonylureas if you're at the bottom right. And then in terms of linkage to cohorts, we can link to genetic cohorts, to so GODARTs and UK Biobank, and we can look at these concepts of partition polygenic scores so we can map the genetic etiology across this tree. And I won't go through this in detail, but essentially this group down at the bottom left genetically are the group who are genetically lipodystrophic, and they're the group who fail quickest on TZDs. Okay, so that was uh, a, a brief um, overview of cohorts. And the reason I wanted to introduce cohorts is that we have a really exciting initiative that Reacher Software is leading within the BHF Data Science Center, where we um, have funding um, to develop a cohort TRE, Trusted Research Environment, specifically for cohorts. So if you have a cohort, you will be able to bring it into the TRE securely um, in a way that you maintain control over it and you maintain governance of that cohort. And you would then be able to apply to get linkage to the national data, and we would help you do that process, and we would streamline that process for you. And so we would then be able to bring in a whole variety of different cohorts, all and with data linkage. And I know there's many diabetes cohorts out there that I think would be incredibly valued um, to link to their to, to 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 available data sets because so much of what you can gain with these cohorts is long term, and we will in due course be developing the, the compute facility to manage genomics and other imaging data, for example. So, and diabetes specific, we have one cohort already coming in, which is address two, which is um, a type one diabetes and, and, and the high risk for type one diabetes cohort will be one of the first cohorts to come into this TRE. Um, if you have cohorts and you're interested, then do flag these to me. Okay. We're going to be talking a bit more about driver projects. What I want with the driver projects, and this is where we have the core funding coming up, is um, to really um, use these to, um, to get people working on the data together with specific questions that will increase the use of diabetes data and get people working on computable phenotypes together and agreeing common definitions of, these, of the different phenotypes we're interested in. Um, and Sarah will talk to you more about what we're doing and how we're going to manage that process and, and give out some money to get people working on this data. And finally, I said right at the start that patients are key to this. We have a very strong PPI involvement within the BHF Data Science Centre and with Divis UK, and we're working with both Divis UK and the BHF Data Science Centre uh, patient um, uh, representatives. We have patient on our advisory group, um, and we will be working very closely to ensure that the work that we're doing does align with uh, what patients are interested in. And I shall stop there um, just to put my email and Sarah's email down. Um, do email us if you have anything that you want to discuss with us. Um, and I shall stop sharing and hand on. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, so we'll just leave questions until the end for the Q&A, but I will just pass straight on to our senior healthcare data scientist, uh, John Nolan. Thanks very much, Sarah. Can I check that um, my slides are on screen okay for everybody? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Great, thank you very much. So, hi everyone. Um, yeah, as Sarah said, um, my name is John Nolan. I'm a senior health data scientist with the British Heart Foundation Data Science Centre. Um, in this talk, I will provide a quick introduction to um, the BHF Data Science Centre's health data science team, uh, what it is that we do and how we aim to support research into cardiovascular disease, COVID, and now in supporting the, the diabetes data science catalyst as well. So starting very high level, what is the BHF Data Science Centre? Um, it's a, a partnership between HDR UK and the British Heart Foundation. Um, the British Heart Foundation has provided significant funding to support our work uh, with patients, the public, um, NHS organisations, researchers and clinicians to enable safe and ethical use of data uh, into the causes, prevention and treatment of diseases of the heart and circulation. And our vision is to improve the cardiovascular health of the nation using the power of large-scale data 
and advanced analytics across the UK. So our centre um, has a, a number of uh, key thematic areas. And so uh, firstly, structured data uh, um, aiming to provide better access to and use of uh, nationally collated structured and coded data. Unstructured data and um, similarly providing access to unstructured data such as uh, cardiac and brain imaging or free text in medical notes. Personal monitoring data, uh, exploring how we data from apps and wearables can be used and linked to other health data sets to inform trajectories of um, health and disease. Computable phenotypes, which Ewan touched on, so um, developing and cataloging methods to define cardiovascular uh, disease and diabetes uh, and um, facilitating the sharing of these phenotypes so that it can be reused by researchers. Enhancing so cohort. Oh. Sorry, can I pause you for two seconds? I think we're having a slight, slight, slight issue. Can I just ask um, in the comments, can everyone see the slides? Two seconds, I believe. Um, can so someone can see it? Sorry, I've had a couple of comments that we can't. Okay, I'm getting a, I'm getting a lot of yeses here. Okay, oh, that's so good. I can't <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. No problem. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yes, enhancing cohorts, which again you and touched on, um, where um, we aim to support facilitating the linkage of existing cohorts to electronic health records to better understand um, the causes of, of um, diseases. Data enabled trials, uh, facilitating the use of uh, the routinely collected healthcare data, e.g., GP or hospital records, to identify and recruit or to follow up the health of participants involved in a trial more efficiently. Um, and finally, uh, the Diabetes Data Science Catalyst, which uh, Ewan has just described in depth, uh, where we're extending the focus of the centre to support research of relevance to both diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So in this talk, I will be primarily uh, focusing on the work being carried out under the structured data theme and also um, uh, the, the Diabetes Data Science Catalyst, as just described by Ewan. Uh, so the, the CVD COVID UK COVID impact project is um, the main project that drives forward the work of the uh, structured data theme. Um, this project aims to understand the relationship between COVID-19 and cardiovascular diseases such as heart attack, heart failure, stroke and blood clot in the lungs. This is achieved through analysis of de-identified, pseudonymized, linked and nationally collated healthcare data in trusted research environments across uh, uh, the four nations of the UK. And COVID impact is an extension of this project, which broadens the scope to look at all COVID related research using data available in the NHS Digital or NHS England now, TRE only. So uh, this slide shows uh, the current position for the, the, the CBD COVID UK COVID impact project in numbers. So we currently have over 350 members from across over 50 academic and NHS institutions, over 90 analysts and researchers working on approved projects and using roughly 70 data sets uh, spread across three trusted research environments in England, Scotland and Wales. And on screen again is the, the data dashboard that um, Ewan um, also showed. So the consortium provides approved researchers with access to a wide range of data sets from across um, the NHS England TRE, Sale Data Bank for Wales and the Scottish National Data Safe Haven. Data is available on, for primary and secondary care uh, on deaths, community prescribing, COVID-19 lab tests and vaccinations, intensive care admissions and cardiovascular disease audits. And um, in recent months, we've also received, received access to maternity services and to mental health services data sets in the NHS England TRE as well. Just touching now on um, diabetes data available and in particular the, the National Diabetes Audit. So working with Ewan and Sarah, um, our team has carried out a comparison of the data available in the National Diabetes Audit with um, GDPPR, which is our primary care data set in NHS England. And I'll just um, share on screen now a, a, a table which shows, that, um, shows the results of the comparison. So on screen we have um, the range of SNOMED code clusters, which uh, form the, the core um, 
uh, section of the National Diabetes Audit. So this is there's a list of 34 code clusters. This column indicates whether these clusters are available in our GDPPR data. And on the right, we see the numbers of, of codes that are available in both the NDA, in GDPPR, and in the NDA only. And the important uh, message here is that there are almost no codes that are exist only in the National Diabetes Audit that aren't also in um, our uh, GDPPR data. So in summary, there are 34 SNOMED code clusters uh, and roughly 12,000 SNOMED codes captured in the core National Diabetes Audit. This comparison showed that 28 of those clusters and all the associated codes therein are available in the GDPPR data set in, uh, in our TRE. Four clusters were not available in GDPPR, but uh, these all related to codes that we wouldn't expect to have access to, as they all related to patients um, who are dissenting from their, their code being used in the National Diabetes Audit, uh, essentially flags to indicate those patients. Uh, finally, there were two clusters, but relating to only 11 codes that were unavailable in GDPPR. So the take home message here is very much that GDPPR essentially captures almost all of the coded data available in the, the core National Diabetes Audit. Uh, moving on, I, I wanted to introduce um, all the members of the health data science team. So um, along with uh, Tom Bolton, I head up the team and um, we both joined the BHF Data Science Centre at the end of 2021. The team expanded rapidly last year as we recruited three health data scientists, Meridad Mizani, Zach Welshman and Lars Murdoch, as well as three early career health data scientists and um, Jamie Farrell, Anna Stevenson and Fiona Chalmers. And the primary focus of our team is to provide data management and data curation support to researchers in the CBD COVID UK COVID Impact Consortium and now the Diabetes Data Science Catalyst to help them to plan, conduct and complete their approved um, projects more rapidly. I thought it'd be useful to outline um, exactly what we mean by data curation and in particular a data curation pipeline. So by this we mean the process of transforming the range of data sets required for a project into a set of analysis ready data that has been designed to answer a specific research question. This is a process that all researchers and projects will need to undertake as part of the project. This process typically involves data management, data wrangling, data cleaning, data harmonization and an emphasis on inbuilt checks. Typical stages of a data creation pipeline are cohort selection, identifying the cohort patient's uh, characteristics and demographics, and identifying patient covariates, exposures, and outcomes. And on this slide, I'm showing a, a quote from the, the Goldacre Review, which um, uh, stated that it is estimated that 80% of the work for data science within NHS records is spent on data preparation. And I think this forms uh, one of the main motivations for our team, which is to accelerate research by reducing the proportion and the amount of time uh, taken to get researchers to the analysis phase of their research projects. As some projects also work across uh, multiple TREs carrying out um, multi-nation research, we also want to provide consistent data creation pipelines that result in analysis ready data that is as similar as possible across the TREs despite any diff underlying differences in the, the source data sets and in the research environments. We aim to do this by developing resources to help researchers to both understand and use data sets um, in, the, in the trusted research environments. So firstly, in terms of uh, understanding the data, we aim to de develop data notes which summarise the key need to know information about each data set. So for example, on screen here for uh, GDPPR, our primary care data in England. This data set is a very simple data set in terms of its structure. It is a, a single table of patient IDs with event codes and associated dates and values. However, there is a lot of features of the data that users need to be aware of. For example, there's exclusion inclusion criteria, um, which dictates that only patients alive as at the 1st of November 2019 are included. It contains only a subset of the available uh, SNOMED CT codes, and also the look back periods vary for the different code types within the data. 
These are all things that a user would need to be aware of in order to, to understand and to use the data correctly. We aim to produce data notes that provide in-depth descriptions of the key features of data sets that users need to be aware of. We can also provide links to relevant external content and point users to um, useful data summary and insight notebooks and other exploratory data analyses within the TREs and to any existing and available code to produce curated versions of the data sets within the TREs. Next up, um, data dictionaries. Um, we aim to provide dictionaries that provide a single source of information for all variables across all data sets, along with their descriptions, formats, and crucially, the list of associated values that each variable can take to allow uh, researchers to quickly interpret and translate the data. Data summaries. So uh, we've worked alongside the NHS England uh, Data Wrangler team in the TRE there to develop data summary notebooks, which provide for each data set batch and variable summaries, data coverage plots to show the time period covered by each data set, and plots to allow users to compare the data by year uh, and to allow them to assess when data is complete uh, up to for each data set and to identify a suitable sensor date for their analyses. Variable completeness summaries, um, which show the um, the completeness for each variable in, within each data set, and finally linkage metrics to show how each data set uh, links to all of the other available data sets within that given TRE. Uh, and we are working to extend these data summaries across all of the, the three TREs we have currently have access to. These summaries are particularly useful um, when used alongside the data dictionaries for scoping projects and understanding what analysis is feasible with the available data sets. Data insight notebooks. So by this, uh, we mean a series of exploratory data analysis that helps us to better understand data sets and which can be shared with researchers via notebooks within the TREs. This allows researchers to view the results of analyses and also the code that has produced um, the analysis. So for example, for our primary care data in England, looking at data coverage for the data set, but not at an overall data set level, but for the different types of codes that are recorded in primary care. So by doing this, we can see that for diagnostic coding, we have data that stretches back many years and provides long disease histories for patients, but that for prescribing codes and also for measurement codes for things like blood pressure and cholesterol, we only have data going back to mid-2018. Another example is investigating the completeness of diagnostic coding within our um, hospital outpatients data to identify the proportion of records with the meaningful ICD-10 code over time. An initial glance at, at this field would suggest that the ICD-10 code was um, populated with 100% completeness, but a deeper dive exploring the data and excluding generic and meaningless codes shows that the, the meaningful ICD-10 code completeness is actually around 5% for outpatients data. We can also then summarise the number of outpatient records by ICD-10 chapters to help users to understand the contents of coded fields. Similarly, for, for researchers who want to use primary care data to identify a population cohort, we can explore how the volume of IDs in our primary care data compares to the published GP list size and to the ONS population estimates, and then explore and explain the reasons for the differences between these figures. In terms of using the data, we aim to support researchers by providing generic and project-specific uh, code demos, which provide researchers with example code showing, a, showing how to carry out the kinds of data management and manipulation steps that they are likely to need in their projects. So researchers might need to code in a new language when starting work in a, in a TRE. For example, a researcher with an R or a STATA background who then needs to write SQL or Python or PySpark code for their data curation pipeline. So we can provide code demos to show example code for connecting to, to data sets and tables, reading in, selecting required data, uh, variables, and creating new derived variables for joining data sets and grouping and summarizing the data. Curated data. Uh, so we also aim to provide code that uh, allows users to create cleaned, streamlined, practical, and easy to use versions of, of data sets. So in the example shown on screen here for hospital admissions, 
reshaping the ICV-10 coded fields from wide format to long format to facilitate easier code list matching, standardizing the variable names and, and formats to help combine this data with other data sets within the TRE, and finally cleaning the ICV-10 code field to remove any trailing white space or special characters to ensure that all the uh, correct code matches are made. Other examples of data curation code that um, is already and available off the shelf is for removing duplicate records from death registry data to ensure that there's only one record, as we would expect per patient, uh, and also applying data cleaning rules to vaccination data to ensure that it has been cleaned and formatted consistently with data uh, from the other TREs. Finally, uh, data curation pipeline functions. Um, so an example is the function that we use to derive P key patient characteristics such as sex, year and month of birth, ethnicity, um, uh, across uh, multiple data sources. This is something that almost all projects will make use of as part of their curation pipelines in the NHS England TRE. The function selects the columns of interest um, from the primary care, hospital episodes and death records, and then harmonizes and binds the data from the different sources together before applying a set of rules to form a single summary record for, for each patient in the TRE. Function also provides outputs to allow users to check the data by looking at the sources that the patient characteristics are being identified from and to identify how far back in time um, these are being identified from relative to the specific study start date for the project. These are the types of checks that we aim to build into all of our code and pipeline functions to give researchers as much information as possible and the ability to scrutinize and sense check the outputs um, of the, the code. So another example is the code we've written to match project code lists to, to a patient's hospital, primary care, prescribing and death records to identify covariates out, uh, outcomes and exposures. We've written this code to provide plots that show the distribution of patients over calendar time or relative to a study start date and to show which sources patients are being identified from. So in this example, we can see that patients with depression are, have been identified largely from primary care records, while both diabetes and hypertension cases have been picked up primarily from the, the medication coding. Code also produces output tables which summarise which sources uh, cases are being identified from for each uh, covariate or outcome, and also a summary showing the number of records and patients identified by each individual code. This is important uh, output data for researchers to review um, to ensure that their code lists are behaving as they would expect, and particularly for researchers working across multiple TREs, these outputs can be used to ensure consistency uh, between the countries and to identify uh, any, anything that might need um, further investigation and to be corrected within the code lists. Finally, uh, an ongoing part of the work of our team is directed uh, to, towards supporting uh, researchers and projects. This can mean reviewing project proposals, so assessing the feasibility of a project proposal based on the data we have. This is something that uh, is becoming easier and quicker the more resources and the more knowledge that we build up on our data sets. We also aim to meet with all new researchers to understand their project requirements and where possible to signpost them to relevant documentation and resources and to any code demos or off-the-shelf code, off code that they may be able to adapt and use for their projects. The level of support we provide varies from project to project, uh, so sometimes it's just signposting researchers to available resource, resources or to, to code. Uh, for others, we can take more of a lead role in de the development of the data curation pipeline to build the analysis ready data sets. So a typical pipeline might have the following stages um, setting parameters, cohort selection, identifying key patient characteristics uh, and identifying uh, patient covariates, outcomes and exposures. And as this recent example on screen now shows um, can require uh, something in the, the, the range of 18 different scripts and thousands of lines of code. Uh, for this particular project, we were able to draw on a lot of pre-existing code developed on previous projects, which we were able to adapt and to apply to the data specification for this project and to build the analysis ready data over a course of a few weeks, something that would likely have taken uh, a number of months when we first started in the TRE. With the, our expanded team, 
Um, and as we support more projects and produce better understanding of the data and more ready to use data curation code, we aim to make the process of building a data curation pipeline uh, quicker uh, for, for more projects in future as well. Oops. So finally, uh, just to say uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope that was a useful introduction to the work of the health data science team. I will stop sharing now and uh, pass over to um, Cameron. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. So I think if Cameron, if you're ready to share your slides now, and um, just to say we've got a few a few questions building up in the QA, so that's great, but we'll come back to those at the end. Thanks, everyone. Okay, I'll share my screen. So hopefully you're all able to see that now. Yeah, that's great, Cameron. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Cameron Razier. And yeah, I've been part of two projects which have been working on uh, this WHF COVID uh, CVD platform. And I'm here to sort of talk you through the journey from the very inception to you know, how we apply and uh, through to actually, actually accessing the data and wrangling and uh, analyzing the data. So we have two projects within our team. We have one regarding multimorbidity, um, which is looking at the association between multiple long-term conditions and COVID-19 outcomes among different population groups. Um, and that's in those with and without different types of CVD uh, subtypes. We have another uh, project which Ewan mentioned earlier regarding diabetes, and that's to calculate incident diabetes following COVID-19 infection in those with and without different types of CVD, and then compare that to influenza in both current and historical data. And as you can see, so we're a multidisciplinary team of uh, statisticians, epidemiologists, clinicians, data scientists at the University of Leicester. And these, you know, the six of us here are sort of the main people working on the projects. So I think to go back to the start in terms of how we actually applied to the, uh, to get projects within the BHF COVID DVD space, we, you know, as, as you were mentioned, the project has to be related to cardiovascular disease and COVID-19. You then complete a preliminary proposal, um, so not, not super in-depth or anything, and then that's reviewed by the core BHF team with, you know, some comments back and potentially some back and forth. Once that's agreed upon, uh, as again, as you had mentioned, there's lots of PPI, so patient public involvement and engagement, um, and, you know, that's just to confirm that your project, you know, is, is, is meeting, you know, patients and public's expectations and, you know, you're answering those questions that are important to them, which again is really important to, and, and good to stay relevant in terms of that. You then produce a, pro a more detailed protocol, which is then sh shared onto the shared space and that can actually be reviewed by all BHF members and you can really get some insightful comments and pieces of information from obviously your peers uh, who are you know experts in the field and then once that's agreed upon your then you know uh, your data access process begins so roughly I guess it depends how quickly and how available members of your team are but that process probably takes anywhere from four to eight weeks if you obviously much sooner if you're more available and, you know, can attend all the meetings quite quickly with a quick turnaround. So in terms of once you have your protocol accepted and then you're beginning to think about actually accessing the data, you I think need to decide which team members you want to access the data, as I'm not sure, I think, whether there's a cost associated with having, you know, members of your team, uh, or at least, you know, you don't want everyone on the uh, to require access if they're not going to if they're not going to need it, um, you have to complete the MRC research GDP, GDPR and confidentiality training, 
or ONS uh, accredited researcher training to be able to access the data in the trusted research environment. Once that's all confirmed, you be, you know emailed an ac uh, yeah, access link following the instructions from NHS Digital. And then I think one thing to note, which is quite important, is to understand sort of which statistical software and languages you'll require, because in the uh, trusted research environment, there may not be, or there may be certain uh, languages. So for example, to do analysis rather than cleaning, a lot of our team use Stata, whereas I think you need to put in a request to actually uh, access Stata, whereas Python are another languages that are in there already. So these are the data sources that we required specifically for our projects. So as both John and Ewan mentioned, you know, there's a a real breadth of different um, data sources within the environment. So it's really good to be able to link this sort of different data and, you know, you can get greater insight to help answer your research questions. So we required HES data, so adult critical care and admitting patient care, linked ONS mortality, the COVID-19 second generation surveillance system for COVID-19 tests in Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, um, obviously GDPR data, so essentially yeah. uh, primary care data. And then when we actually move on to our project and you know we've been we've been approved, we've got access to the data, and then there we are, we're in the research environment and we're trying to think about okay. What, what do we do at this point? Because, you know, pick different groups and people are at different stages in terms of their knowledge of uh, data wrangling, data cleaning. Um, so some generic sort of data issues that we face, which you would face in many different uh, data sources as, you know, the ones that you had mentioned earlier, but obviously working in a new environment. So actually just navigating the environment can sometimes be, um, you know, a bit complex. Or you're working with new software and languages, as John mentioned. You obviously have multiple data sources to handle, which we which we found, and which because obviously we're using lots of different data, so primary care data, secondary care data, mortality. Again, each source has their own individual data quality issues, so it's important, I guess, to know that going in and understand, which I'm sure many people here will, but you know, you, you understand what's available, the limitations, and um, again, how you can sort of, how you shape your research question is impacted by that. Clearly, things like missing data, um, you know, extracting relevant data since there's so much data, um, and again, the process of you know uh, wrangling data can potentially be comp computationally intensive. So, more specific re uh, issues that we face regarding our projects. So, obviously, using GDPR data, you, we we wanted to define certain outcomes and we required specific SNOMED code lists for this. So for example, multimorbidity or diabetes. And then for, for any one condition, there are multiple SNOMED codes. So then it's trying to find an updated and, you know, or adding new SNOMED codes that we think are relevant to, to help define our outcome. Um, this can be time consuming if, for example, the definitions that you want are not publicly available. That might mean having to do it yourself if they're not, you know, if, if they're not shared in the space or, you know, are publicly available online. Other issues were, how do we define certain outcomes? For example, long COVID, do we use diagnosis codes? Do we diagnose it another way? Um, again, sort of John touched upon that in his uh, slide deck earlier. Again, lots of, yeah, sort of define our outcomes, exposures, index dates, sensor dates. And again, that comes with knowledge of the, the data sets. And I'll touch upon how we solve these issues in the next slide. Clearly, again, another big issue is cleaning episodic level data to individual level and yeah, data specific um, uh, wrangling and software sort of, we need certain software to be able to do certain things or software that you are more familiar with. So it, it requires sometimes trying to ask for that. So in the case of us to do analysis, we would prefer Stata. So it's 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 getting ahead of the game and require you know uh, requesting that from the relevant people. So how we overcame our issues. So in terms of 
the simple navigation um, around the env environment or you know multiple queries just engaging with the slack channel proved to be really helpful um, and then for the more complex issues regarding snowmed codes for example we worked with ewan in terms of trying to define an updated diabetes um snowmed code list which i think colleague my colleagues have done with ewan um the probably most important and most helpful regarding you know actually wrangling with the data as again john mentioned they offer lots and lots of different types of support which we found super helpful so that was really um yeah indispensable really for us progressing our projects at the beginning so we do have data scientists and we do have experience handling large data sets but in a new environment it's sometimes a bit more complex and okay, so the meetings we had with for example john or tom or Mirdad were fantastic you know we talked through our project design it was you know it involved recycling and creating functions to save on time and cleaning um you know obviously exploring github and code repositories from externally but also within other projects within the uh, trusted research environment and obviously the health data scientists were able to point us to them and say oh you know this team have done this you can recycle this whereas we might not know that um going in so again it was really you know really helpful to have that support there um and regular support as well so it was, it was quite fantastic really and then again regarding if you require certain software you know reaching out to the relevant teams in due course so for example we got in touch with nhs digital around getting access to data to do you know uh, analysis rather than data wrangling and cleaning it so again sort of just in terms of the practicalities of how we did what we did in terms of going through this pipeline of getting an approval through to accessing the data and being able to clean and analyze the data the softwares we use were databricks python where we use pyspark and pandas sql and that was mainly for again the data wrangling side of things and then for analysis we could use python or stata um, regarding timelines i chatted to my colleagues around this and really it depends on your experience um, but the main thing is, you know, with the support that's offered, uh, you know, it shouldn't really be too long. You know, if you're, you've never done this before, there's lots and lots of uh, support on hand to be able to help you navigate and complete your, you know, data wrangling, for example. So if, you know, now I've gone through sort of the process and any issues you may have had, um, and how we resolve them, it's just some preliminary findings from our multimorbidity project. So this gives you an example of how we, you know, so once we cleaned our data from episodic level data through to sort of individual level data, where we have 62 million, 62.7 million people in the GDPBR data set. And then we obviously apply our inclusion and exclusion criteria, where when if we get to this bottom uh, sort of box that shows us we have you know, 1.1 million uh, individuals without any missing covariate data with the relevant outcome data. Um, and that, that's our population to work with for this specific research question. Obviously, different research question will have different, um, you know, total cohort population. And then when we want to look at some of the preliminary baseline data that we uh, exported. So when we look at our cohort of 1.1 million and we look at long-term conditions we can see the distribution of for example ethnicity uh, you know age and then for people that do have more than w one cvd uh, so essentially they, everyone has uh, a, C a cvd condition but then in those with another condition you know what is the distribution of people with you know so CK, uh, ckd and a form of CV, uh, cvd you know 4.2 percent of people with cvd also have ckd and it's you know it's useful to see these breakdowns which we'll then go on to explore later because unfortunately we haven't quite got onto the modeling or uh, confirmed those results so we were not able to export them yet to uh, share with the wider uh, public 
So, but yeah, yeah that'll come in due course. So I think some uh, some concluding points regarding our journey and the practicalities of actually using the trusted research environment is to really you know engage with the health data scientists and the support that they offer, whether that's through the Slack channel or you know the weekly drop-in sessions. I think that's really imperative to you know if you want to succeed. Obviously, if you don't need the support, then that's that's great. Um, but you know we found it to be invaluable um, and I think yeah I assume that's the same I need similar feedback from other groups but uh, yeah that's one big recommendation and then obviously I can answer further questions um, regarding any practicalities of the process and how we found it but uh, yeah that's everything from me so thank you very much Thanks, Cameron. That was great. Um, so just before we go on to the Q&A, um, I'm going to just quickly start sharing my screen. And I think I get the, the pleasant job of telling you all about the funding call. Um, so bear with me a few seconds. OK. Can I just get some of the panellists to nod at me if you can see my slides OK? Yep. Brilliant, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see, just take a few, few minutes just to tell you about our call for funding that we've got coming up. Um, so we're planning to open the call for funding in March this year. Um, the total funding is approximately £500,000. Um, so the funding call is going to be open across all of the BHF, DSC and Data Science Centre thematic areas. However, around about 120 to 150,000 pounds will be ring fenced for diabetes data science catalyst projects. And from that, um, from across the total amount, we expect, expect to fund around about eight to 10 projects. Um, and that is variable depending on the, the sort of um, assessment process, which we haven't actually, we're still finalizing those details. Uh, so the priorities across this, all of the thematic areas will be research within the CVD COVID UK COVID impact infrastructure. Um, so I'll just say that the project should have a COVID focus in addition to the cardiovascular and diabetes um, element. However, I'll just point out there's a slight difference. We've talked a lot about CVD COVID UK and COVID impact today. So part of the CVD COVID UK element requires there to be a cardiovascular um, component to the project, but COVID impact does not necessarily have to have that cardiovascular element to the project. Um, so again, we were looking for research which aligns with one or more of the centre's thematic areas. We've heard a lot about the different areas from John and um, from Ewan today about the computable phenotypes um, and some of the other work that we're doing. We are interested particularly in research that spans multiple UK nations and also the research that helps us to showcase evidence of best practices and the tools and technologies that are developed as part of the project. And finally, we want to have research that is deliverable within the current data and that utilises a wide range of the data sets. And um, so again, I'll refer you back to sort of John and Ewan's green slides with all of the data that's available and a huge amount of data that is that is available within um, the CDD COVID UK COVID impact infrastructure. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> um, so in terms of diabetes priorities, sorry, I've got little faces in my way here. Um, in terms of the diabetes um, priorities, we really want to see research that helps to build resource for the diabetes community. And um, we're also looking for research that's at the intersection of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and projects that help us to promote the work of the catalyst. And so finally, um, I know that Cameron's done a really good job of, of telling us about the benefits of support of working within the infrastructure, but again, the projects will get the benefit of working with the health data science team and the CVD COVID UK COVID impact consortium, and um, there's a lot of support available there. And as part of the CVD COVID UK COVID infrastructure, the researchers would have access to, to this data at no additional cost to the project. 
And finally, just to say that the Diabetes Catalyst Project researchers, so that's those, those ring fence projects for the, specifically for the catalyst, will be asked to contribute to a fortnightly working group with other analysts and some of our healthcare data science team just to share experiences and to help contribute to the diabetes data quality and codes within the TRE and really just to obviously bolster the delivery of the projects and to make sure that we can offer as much support as possible. Um, so that's all I have to say about the project, so um, the funding call. Well, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll move on to the Q&A. So bear with me two seconds and I will start. Okay. Here we go. So I think we have some questions ready. So I'm just going to jump straight in. So the first question I have is, um, I think it might be for John, but I'm not too sure. So do you have any data about gestational diabetes and also popula population-based data about BDM? Or maybe Ian? I just won't see who wants to pick that one up. I guess we could both address it. Um, um, so the, the, the main data set I'm aware of around pregnancy data is in the NDA, so so it's the the National Pregnancy and Diabetes Audit data. Um, there's no bespoke or specific GDM or gestate or, or diabetes and pregnancy data within the TRE uh, within the NHS England TRE, um, unless there's a data set I'm missing, John. Uh, no, thanks, you. And um, I was just going to say that the. Um, for projects that have um, been looking to identify cases of gestational diabetes um, before, what I'm aware of is um, that um, this has been picked up from ICD-10 coding in the, the, um, the, the delivery records in the HES uh, APC maternity data set, essentially. So um, I think that would be the main source, would be ICD-10 coding from the delivery records. But uh, having said that, we do, as I mentioned, now have access to the maternity services data set as well. Um, I think we got access to this uh, just a month ago, so that is being explored and that is um, off the top of my head another potential source uh, of this information. So something for us to go away and think about, I think. But, but I guess on that note, you know, it's definitely an area of interest and, and anyone on the call who knows about other data sets um, or has worked on any of this data um, that can help us, then we can obviously um, you know, discuss with us and we, we, we can work on that together. Okay. We've got a comment in the chat from Sarah Feiner just saying that I understand that GDM data is coming to NPID in the future, but isn't started yet, so we rely on variable quality hospital closing for now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so the next question, is a standard model used in the TRE, for example, OMOP? Also, what coding systems are used there? Um, and I'll add on here as well, is any of the data pipeline or PySpark code available as open source, for example, on GitHub? I'm assuming that's for John. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I'll try and pick that one up anyway. Um, so the short answer on OMOP is, is no, currently. Um, the data that we work with is all uh, in the, the original format as provided by the, the data providers. Um, there is a project underway that's being led by Angela Wood, uh, our um, lead of the, the structured data thematic area, to, to look at OMOPing um, uh, an initial phase of data sets, I think focusing on uh, the hospital admissions data in England uh, to, um, to OMOP that. Uh, so I think um, that project is just getting underway. There's funding in place to do that. And it'll be something for our teams to, to look at that, to see what the, the potential benefits or drawbacks are of, of working with that OMOP data set um, for our work within the consortium. In terms of the, the code terminologies that are available in our data and um, so in terms of the hospital episode uh, well, secondary care data in England, Scotland and Wales, this is uh, ICD-10 coding um, within primary care, it varies. So in uh, NHS England, the GDPPR data, which is our primary care data source, uh, uh, contains SNOMED coding, while in the SAIL data bank, the, the primary care data uh, is coded with uh, read codes version 2. 
Um, the only other thing I would say on that is that some of the newer data sets that we've got access to, like the Emerging Secure data set, uh, IAPT, and the um, I think the Mental Health and Maternity Services data set, where coding is provided, it tends to be now in the, the SNOMED terminology. Um, so um, hopefully that gives a summary of, of the different terminologies used. Finally, on the point about um, the SQL and PySpark code, uh, all um, completed projects from the consortium are required to, to share the data curation code and the analysis code that they used in the course of their project. And that's then provided and shared via the um, BHF Data Science Centre GitHub organisation. Um, so I think a lot of the code that is developed is currently within the TRE, but gradually as projects reach com uh, the completion stage of their project, it becomes available in the GitHub external to the TREs. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I've, I've got a feeling the next question may also be for you. There's quite a lot of coding questions here. Um, so from the curated data screenshots, it looks like some of the coding uses ICD-10. Have you considered coding using SNOMED CT to enable ontological queries to support research? So yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, just based on the, the one example that I gave, that was the, um, the HES APC and that does um, that is provided to us by NHS England with ICD-10 coding in the same way that it is from, from Scotland and Wales. So we've not considered using SNOMED CT in that context. That would require onward mapping of that code and um, the of those codes. And the fact that the, the ICD-10 coding is consistent with, with England, uh, Scotland and Wales um, means that we're, we're inclined just to, to leave it uh, with that terminology. Um, currently. So it's, it's not something we've considered, but I'm um, interested to, to hear how that, that might be um, uh, an option or um, beneficial going forward. So just to say, I can see that Kate's commented, if anybody wants to raise their hands and answer back um, for or ask any additional questions from John's feedback, please do just um, join your hand and I'll try and, I'll try and pick up as best as I can. Um, so just moving on to the next question, it says, where does one submit a proposal to for accessing the data from a TRE for academic dissertation? And what is the timeline to gain access to such data after a proposal submission? Kathy, do you want to pick that one? Yeah, maybe that's one for me. Um, so, uh, yes, thanks. And the, the, there's actually a following um, question, which is kind of maybe linked for this from someone who's doing a, a master's degree in health data science and wants to find out more. So if you're thinking about submitting um, an application, the best thing first to do is to go to our website. Um, and the current website, if you just um, Google CVD COVID UK, you will alight on the relevant web page. You can find out what projects are going on. You can get a, um, an updated uh, shot of that slide that both Ewan and John showed about the data sets available. But you can also find out who's leading the various projects and also a list of all the current members of the consortium. So if you're sort of sitting in a university somewhere and you're um, an early career researcher, there may well be someone in your university you can connect with directly who's already working on a project, or there may be someone in another university who's working in the area that's precisely of interest to you. And uh, the, it's a really great way to start is to connect with someone who's already active in the environment. Um, the web pages also tell you about how you submit a proposal and what our ways of working are and all the principles and processes you need to go through. So Cameron obviously gave us an outline from his perspective, which was a, a really good kind of um, journey through the process, but it's all kind of mapped out for you there. So that's probably the best place to start um, and, and start contacting people and feel free to get in touch with us um, via Reuven Preden. And I'm sure one of the team can put um, his details in the chat. So he's the project manager who oversees that process of applying for access to data. So if you have a query you can't um, find the answer to on our web page easily, then please feel free to get in touch with Reuven and he will either answer it or steer you in the right direction. Yeah, I see his email address has come up. So hopefully that's helpful for a couple of those questions there. Hey, thanks, Kathy. Um, I think we've got another technical one coming up next. Um, so, is the TRE a Citrix-based environment with the usual copy-paste import-export restrictions? Developing complex analysis code in this type of environment is very difficult and too slow. Do John's team develop in this environment? 
Thanks, Sarah. So yeah, this is um, like everything else, a varied picture across the, the three TREs that we currently have access to. So the Sale Data Bank for Wales, for example, does provide uh, an import portal where um, any uh, reference data files or code scripts can be uploaded to the TRE um, instantly, essentially. Um, so if you uploaded a, a, a script via the, the portal external to the TRE, you can then log in and immediately access that code. Um, and the situation is similar for Scotland, except that um, any files like that would have to go via your research coordinator. So it would be a case of uh, providing any code or reference data that you wanted to integrate into your project to your to the research coordinator for our project, who would then you know, uh, verify that this um, that these files um, were what the, um, the the user said they were, and upload those uh, to to the the safe haven environment. For NHS England, the current situation is that we can copy paste code into cells and in, in the Databricks. So what that means is you can copy and paste either code snippets or C or small CSV files into the the TRE. Uh, to integrate those into your to your scripts. However, that can be quite challenging if there is a lot of scripts, a lot of different code, or if there's very large um, uh, large numbers of rows in a reference data set that you, that you that want you wanted to upload. So we have been working alongside NHS England to um, develop a, 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 a portal similar to the Sale Data Bank that will be available um, hopefully later this year as part of the, the, the trusted research environment for NHS England. And that would allow us to, to upload code and other files to, to the, the trusted research environment. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, so the next question I have is where can we see the funding call? Um, so I can pick that one up. Um, so the funding call is still in development. So we will be launching the funding call in March. So that will be available through the BHF Data Science webpage, Christopher, the usual kind of channels, um, and also via HDR UK as well. So um, it's a watch this space and we'll, we'll communicate as much as we possibly can to make sure everyone knows that um, when it's been released. Okay, so that's the last question I think that we currently have on the, the Q&A at the moment, so feel free to keep posting any more or if anybody wants to join in live and ask any questions to any of the panellists, please do pop a hand up. Okay. Maybe I can just, while, while we're waiting for the many questions, um, maybe just reiterate that, you know, we want this to be a sort of a dynamic um, community of researchers um, and I would strongly encourage obviously lots of people to put in for the funding application but also lots of communication um, and with me and with Sarah if you've got questions or you know of, of data resources that we should be using um, do just just shout um, and you know we, we will build up that community and I think that's really what we want to be doing in this catalyst. Thanks, Ian. Okay, we'll give another few minutes. Anyone got any other questions? Nope. Doesn't look like it. Nothing else coming like in. We've, we've oh. satisfied everybody. Oh. oh, there we go. Um, so we've got one. Can I clarify, does the proposal have to include COVID or can it diabetes and cardiovascular disease? Shall I take that I'll one? I'll let you um, do that one, yeah. So, so yeah, currently, um, you know, we want we want everybody who's who's funded on these projects to be working within the TRE, so within the CBD COVID UK COVID impact umbrella. Um, one, because it means that we've got everybody working on the same data. And I think that's really helpful in terms of getting a community of people who can help each other. And work, with, and that's where we have the data scientists um, to, to to support everybody. Um, and because of that, there is a COVID requirement uh, based on, on on the governance at the moment. So so there does need to be a COVID element to the research. Kathy. Uh, yeah, maybe I can just yeah just um uh uh. Talk um, add to that answer. Um, so 
there are restrictions on some of the data flowing into some of the data custodians, in particular in this case, um, what was NHS Digital and what is now NHS England. So these data sets have been acquired under COVID specific uh, acquisition principles or the data provisioning notices that have been they've been acquired under. Those need to be updated by the particular data provider custodian bodies, national bodies before we can move forward. So um, uh, the restrictions that apply to us are the same as the restrictions that would apply to anyone else who were uh, contacting or applying to these data custodians to uh, acquire these data. It doesn't apply to all the data sets um, that we are currently accessing. Um, so if, for example, you wanted to only use HES data or only use HES data linked to mortality data to address some non-COVID related question, you could go directly to the data provider and make an application to do that. But the richness of the data sets that we have to get all of them together, currently there is this COVID restriction. Uh, there's a huge amount of work going on behind the scenes um, led by HCA UK and other organizations working together to try and move beyond that situation. Um, and but to enable us to continue to link across these rich data sources. So that's why, as you and Sas, we're so keen for people to start using the data sets now, because if you get familiar with them now, even if your question has to be a uh, very prominently COVID flavoured one, um, then you'll be in a good place for moving on into the next era, which we hope is coming uh, soon around the corner, to be able to apply that knowledge and that capability to a whole range of other questions. And I would also just make the observation that, of course, COVID is a very, has had very pervasive direct and indirect consequences on a wide range of health, health outcomes across a wide range of different areas. So um there are many ways uh, that one can uh, build um a, a very prominent covid angle to research questions into research proposals that really address covid specific questions um but but in, in a way that is is perhaps not as restrictive as it might seem to start with so um get your thinking caps on That's great. Thanks, Cathy. Um, I don't think we've got any other questions. Um, so there's nothing else is coming up. So um, I'll close there. Um, thank you to everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. And it's been really good. Um, it's been great to hear everyone's talks. And um, we'll give you a little bit of your time back. Um, you will shortly receive a survey on SurveyMonkey just about the, the Diabetes Catalyst and the, the webinar today. If you could take just a, just a minute to fill that in and send it back, that would be really appreciated as well. And um, do keep in touch as you see. Um, all of the email addresses have been on the slides today and it'll be up on our YouTube channel, um, I think, either tomorrow or Monday. So um, do keep in touch with us if there's any questions at all. Um, thanks very much.